Well, good morning or good good evening, everyone. I know we've got people across the globe watching this and welcome to the panel on the role of public-private partnerships. I'm really excited about this panel as we have a really esteemed group of panelists that I'm just about to introduce that are gonna bring some, I think, diverse and, and you know robust perspective to this topic. Um, so let me start by introducing each one of them and then we'll get right into the questions and the discussion. Uh, first, we've got Penny Pritzker, uh, Penny is the founder and chairman of PSP Partners and its affiliates, Pritzker Realty, uh, Realty Group, PSP Capital, and PSP Growth. From June 2013 through January 2017, she served as U.S. Secretary of Commerce in the Obama administration and is also on a number of boards, including Microsoft, of International Peace, and a member of the Harvard Corporation. She's got many years of experience in numerous industries, and I think what's going to be more interesting is her experience, particularly founding Skills for America's Future and serving on President Obama's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness and his Economic Recovery Advisory Board. So welcome, Penny, and thank you for your time. Next, we have Sal Khan, who's the founder and CEO of Khan Academy. If any of you have teachers in your family or friends or you know students, I think Khan Academy has really created um, what is a unique database of free online um, you know, courses. Sal started Khan Academy in 2005 by making math tutorials to help his cousins and other people's cousins. And today, 12 years later, Khan Academy has more than 42 million registered users from 190 countries with tutorials on subjects from math to e economics, art history, computer science, health medicine, and much more, and all free. So, uh, you know, the unique perspective of being a nonprofit and, and working with governments and, and other uh, public and private entities is going to be an interesting perspective from Sal. And last but not least, we've got Jeff Majunkalda. Jeff, I hope I pronounce your last name Perfect. right. Um, he's the CEO of Coursera. We talked quite a bit about Coursera yesterday. He joined in 2017, before which he was founding CEO for 17 years of financial engineering, uh, financial en engine, sorry. And we all know Coursera has changed the face of how we think about gaining higher education and essential skills. They have 77 million learners globally and partner with more than 200 of the world's top universities and industry educators to offer courses, specializations, certificates, and degree programs. Beyond what you may know of Coursera as a consumer platform, they also have an enterprise platform and a government platform, Coursera for Business and Coursera for Government. So hopefully set, that sets the frame for me to kick off my questions. Um, and the first one, Penny, I'm gonna direct this to you because this sort of frames just, I think the perspective, the problem we're trying to solve and how public private partnerships can be an important part of the equation. So as we know, we're in a rapidly evolving education and sort of work skill, uh, upskilling landscape and changing skills landscape. And PPE, PPP can be an important part of that equation. I guess, how do you think about that problem and how PPP can be a solution for it and how has that evolved over time? First of all, I'm really pleased to be here and uh, with my peers, it's, it's really, I'm looking forward to this conversation because this is an area I've really been passionate about for you know a couple, two decades or longer. How do we give people the support that they need to adapt and thrive in a changing environment? And God knows we're in a changing environment. Um, you know, where the disruption that we're seeing uh, is, you know, began long before the pandemic, if you will, but really began, as you said, with, you know, organizations like Sol, uh, Khan Academy or Coursera or others, um, you know, with the advent of digitization, automation, and, um, you know, obviously then uh, the impact further acceleration of adoption with the pandemic. Um, and so I would start with the fact that um, we really need a massive cultural change. And so your point about public-private partnerships is they're essential. They're absolutely essential. Um, it's a wake-up call what's going on today, I think, for mayors and governors, for business leaders, and for educational institutions. And let me just, I don't think any of those organizations can handle the change that's going on alone. And so that's why we have to partner and that's why we have to come together. And I'll give you some perspective. Government is not spending enough money. We're spending in the United States, government spend on training is about 0.1% of GDP. 
it's the lowest of all of the OECD countries except Mexico and Chile. And we, on top of it, we're trying to spread that spend across 43 employment and training programs. And they're inadequate, they're uncoordinated, and they're underfunded. And big companies are definitely focused on training, but small and medium sized educate uh, enterprises can't afford to provide the kind of training that uh, individuals need today in order to thrive in this environment. So we've got to come together and we've got, you know, so my observations are really ones of we've got to have business at the table because ultimately we've got to be training towards employability. Second is governors and mayors need to be involved um, because they often control the sources of much of the training. Many of the community colleges, the university, you know, state universities and others. Um, and so I think that public private partnerships are absolutely essential. Jeff or Sal, you, you want to add any commentary here before we sort of, you know, dive in a little further? Uh, yeah, I guess what I guess what I would say is that um, the, if, if the challenge is the world is moving faster and faster than any institutions, whether those are government institutions or private institutions, the job ahead is to figure out how can you keep up with that and maybe how can you get ahead of that. Uh, we think that a lot of what is important is collaboration and, and platforms, whether that's Khan Academy or whether that's you know Amazon or whether that's Coursera, platforms allow a level of friction-free collaboration that has not really been possible before. So it sounds a little bit weird, but I do think platform business models that allow institutional collaboration between governments and universities and employers and also directly to individuals are a huge part of the solution. Uh, we work with a lot of governments all around the world, state workforce development agencies and in New York and Oklahoma and others. Uh, we also work with universities and, and direct to individuals. So. Um, being on a platform where you can collaborate and iterate and, and be very agile in responding to change, uh, I think is a big part of this. And when we talk, I'm sure throughout this presentation about the new opportunities to do this and some of the emerging solutions that we're seeing, there's a lot of promise. I mean, there's a lot of peril, but there's a lot of promise. And I think agility is kind of the key and working together on friction-free platforms is a big part of it. And I'll just add to that exactly what both uh, Penny and 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 I'm saying is is you know there's this notion of you, you need we know what the problems are we know we 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 need to fix them as quickly as possible the private sector whether it's for profit or not for profit that's where you can jump in quickly try things out figure out where you're getting resonance uh, but we know that the public sector and government especially is where you get the scale and in certain cases you get the validation and they go completely hand in hand and there's some interesting ironies where it actually can go the other way around too you know there's so much debate in say k-12 education but oftentimes what higher education decides to do actually has more say on k-12 education than what you know all of the the arguments in the k-12 rooms are and likewise in higher education or k-12 what employers in the private sector want or expect can have a, a larger impact on wh what how uh, higher education needs to change uh, versus just the debates that go on within their own doors. So uh, absolutely, I think we're in a time where it's all gonna get mixed in and there's you know a lot of plates have been thrown up in the air and we all have a collective opportunity to decide how they, how they fall down, hopefully for the better. Yeah, so I wanna double click on that actually, Sal, because you, know, you brought up the concept of interconnectivity between K to 12, um, you know, higher education, vocational skilling, upskilling. When, I guess, when governments see the problem and, and maybe you, you all can correct me, I suspect they see these in silos. So when you think about the opportunity set and who needs to come to the table and where you start the conversation, where, where is the most interesting entry point to start this conversation of partnerships? Is it, do you start at a certain point or do you try to bring everyone at the table and, and solve it? And maybe we can start in the context of the U.S. first in that, in that discussion, because I feel like every country is very different. Yeah, I'll, I'll, take a, I'll take a first stab at that. I mean, you know, I think there's two big areas, especially if we're talking about education. There's kind of the support side of education. How do you learn what you need to know? How do you get motivated to do it? How do you get connected to other people who can support? And then there's the signaling and the, the credentialing side of education. Uh, and I guess maybe we could add a third one or like, what are the things that you actually need to know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we have a system, a lot of the you know, the famously the Committee of Twelve in 1890, I believe, were you know ten university presidents that kind of designed the modern um, 
education system as we have today, they've kind of dictated what the pre what what the high school classes that people take and what years. You know, you take physics your junior year, senior year. You take chemistry this year. You take pre calculus that year. That was just determined in eighteen ninety. Um, and universities, for the most part, have 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 been pretty similar to what they were, what they've been um, in eighteen ninety. And every time people start having this debate of like, well, maybe we should learn different things. Maybe statistics is more important than calculus. Uh, maybe law should be someplace in there, or financial literacy should be someplace in there. They start getting into these fairly high inertia debates, in, you know, amongst faculty or amongst standards bodies. But the reality is, I think, and employers are starting to get here. They realize, well, what do we really care about? We're getting a bunch of college graduates who might have a major, you know, they might even be a biology major. But when I ask them about photosynthesis, which is something that they should have learned in high school, they really didn't master the concept. Or they might be a math major, but if I say, you know, really explain what a derivative is, which they should have learned in high school or the first year of college, they really don't understand it. Or, you know, basic stats, which is frankly useful in any field, they don't understand it. So I think there's an opportunity to think from first principles, well, maybe there's things that take less time to learn, but what you learn, you learn that really, really well that are more valuable out in the world. I, you know, statistics could be an example. You find someone who has truly mastered first year statistics, I'm interested in them. I almost don't care what 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 else, what other degrees they may or may not have. And you know, we're starting to see this uh, both on the Khan Academy and you know, there's another effort that I, I started kind of in response to COVID called schoolhouse.world, which as Jeff mentioned, is kind of an, another platform providing free tutoring and peer-to-peer -peer tutoring. And what we're seeing is, that we're able to pro provide mechanisms using a community where not only can people get support and tutoring above the things that Khan Academy offers, and actually we would love to do to put tutoring as a layer on top of platforms like Coursera as well, but then you can leverage communities to validate people's knowledge. And that there's things like when you give into a community, when you are a tutor, that that actually is the ultimate credential. If, if I can find someone of any age who can tutor someone else and has a high reputation in that, in whatever subject, in machine learning, in algebra, in civics, in law, that's the person I want to hire. And then you have an artifact that the credentialing process itself benefits other people, and it's a it's a, a far more accessible thing to to get, and it's a better signal, frankly, to employers of what of of who's going to be able to do well in their environment. Yeah, Penny, Penny or Jeff, I'll, you wanna? I'll, I don't know if Penny wants to go first on, on this question of kind of point of insertion. Yeah, I, well, no, go, I, go ahead, Jeff. I mean, I think you need a point of insertion everywhere. I mean, the problem is, is that, I mean, I think what Saul is pointing out is it, this, the, um, the needs are interrelated. And so I don't see that you can sort of just divide up and say you know, vocational ed on the one hand, K-12 on the other hand, and universities or community colleges on the third hand, if you will. I think we need to, in a funny way, um, and what digital platforms are doing is breaking down all those arbitrary silos and basically saying, how do we get the individual lined up with the need, the skills and the needs they need? Uh, they need in order to be employable into and stay, you know, and then and then it be a lifelong learner and stay relevant, if you will, whether it's paid for by them, paid for this by the state or paid for by the employer. That's kind of a different question. So in a funny way, I think we need to re-examine the silos that have developed in a way. And and I see at least in you know in Chicago where we're having the most success is where we're working together and breaking that down. Now, obviously Jeff is running a digital platform, but, you know, and, and Saul is providing content. You know, I live in a city where what we're trying to do is make sure that the employers are coming together and they're on, and they're expressing what they need and that the trainers, whether they're online or in a classroom or wherever, we don't actually care, are providing the skills needed in order to fill what are the jobs of the future. So I think that there's... Um, there needs to almost be like a systems rethink in, in, mm -hmm. in my mind. And, and I think we're dancing around that and nobody's really going at that fact. And, and if you look at the federal level, my own experience is you have training sitting at the labor department and you have education at the department of education and you have the states basically receiving most of the money and everybody deciding what's going to go on there. It, it's a system that I don't know that it is, um, 
And it's, we're not going to change the state system. That's probably sacrosanct. But the question is, can we restructure in a way that makes it much easier for the individual? These are, you know, if I'm in voc ed or I'm in high school or I'm in at the university and I'm in high school or I'm in not in high school, who cares? It's really about how do we get the skill training to the individual that matches up with the employability? Yeah, and I, I think, Penny, this, this idea of, um, of silos and systems is pretty important. When we, think, when we think about Coursera, we try to abstract away from that and say, I think of it as sort of a human capital challenge, right? So, so over someone's lifetime, we want them to have human capital that will lead to health and wellness and some prosperity, which means that they have certain skills and abilities to do jobs that are valuable to some you know, business franchise. And that's going to be changing faster and faster. So the obsolescence of skills will be going up. What we've seen, and we do not spend much time in K through 12, but um, at the point where someone is an adult, we see examples where when you take a system and think of it a bit more as a platform, um, the silos do start breaking down a bit. So I'll give you an example of silos breaking down in terms of certain credentials and also even institutional players. So Google had decided that they're going to build a training program for entry-level uh, IT professionals. And this was a, a, a place-based program. You had to come to Google's campus, et cetera. And they said, we need IT support professionals. This is a job that you can do without a tremendous amount of background in the field or foundational knowledge. There are, tr are skills that you can learn in a relatively short period of time. They're highly valuable to businesses. And so let's, let's build this program. It was very successful. They moved it to Coursera so it could be done online. And now there's a five month Google IT professional certificate for people with no college degree and no background in computers. And there are hundreds of thousands of open IT support jobs around the world. So you can learn the skills online to do jobs that you can do online. And after the pandemic where remote working is becoming a much greater possibility, those jobs don't necessarily even have to be in your community. And I take it one step further. We also have bachelor's degrees that are offered by universities on Coursera. University of London has a bachelor's of computer science. They said, you know what? That Google IT certificate teaches a lot of important methods and knowledge about computer science. We'll give you academic credit towards an online bachelor's degree if you finish that IT certificate. Now we see over 700,000 people who don't, net, well, 60% of them don't have a college degree, taking the Google IT certificate, it's like a digital on-ramp to an entry-level job. And then once they get a higher paying job, because you know it's not clear that you're not gonna need the broader education or a college degree, they can earn a college degree online. But this pathway from not being in college to getting a certificate to get the job and the certificate counts towards a college degree and you can get the college degree even if you're not on a campus and you could get it if you're 40 or 50 years old, it really is starting to create a lot of opportunities that we haven't seen before. Right. Well, well, on that note, I guess what I'm also intrigued by, we talked a little bit about the US construct with Penny's um, you know, perspectives. Have you seen models that sort of are starting to scratch their surface, whether it be at certain states in the US or other countries that are sort of starting to see the interoperability and sort of bringing this equation of, you know, what education does all the way to, to skilling. And, and I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd love to hear a few examples from you all. I think that could illuminate how this has sort of played itself out. Well, one, one example that we see is in Costa Rica. So, so Coursera has Coursera for business. That's for businesses to upskill and reskill their employees using our partner's content. Coursera for government is for governments to do workforce development programs to reskill or upskill people who maybe have been displaced or are underemployed. Uh, and then Coursera for campus, which is for the third kind of institution, which is a university, to actually deliver online learning to students who are pursuing a degree there. Costa Rica has created an incredible network between the government um, skilling programs and a lot of the multinational employers who do a lot of business process outsourcing in Costa Rica. And, and language is a major focus, you know, by, uh, being bilingual is a bit major focus of the government. Coursera has been able to basically work across multiple institutions and connect them together. So Coursera for Campus can put programs into the universities that are digital and complement an on-campus program that trains people with skills so that when they graduate, they can actually 
get a job with one of the multinationals who has operations in Costa Rica. The government actually facilitates some of the funding and the bridging of these programs. And one digital platform can basically link institutions together in a fairly loosely coupled ways. But I do think this institutional collaboration on digital platforms is a, is a, is a big possibility. So I, I, you know, I think what's interesting in listening to this is what you're hearing, what Jeff just described requires government, business, and, uh, and educational institutions. And what Coursera is doing is facilitating some of the parts of the collaboration. The other parts of collaboration are fundamentally, you've also got to make sure there's money available to make all of this happen. Some of which, you know, and, and in order for this opportunity to be inclusive, you've got to figure out how to include government funding because not everybody can afford to go get a Coursera course or, or get a, 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 an online, uh, uh, education. And so, and the other thing then in the flip side is you've got to make sure that it is, eff there's efficacy to it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and to the training that people are getting. So if they get a Google IT certificate or they get that they're, they'd actually, it's going to lead them to employability. So it, the collaboration isn't just digital. It's also got to be a collaboration that allows for um, funding and allows for ultimately employability. Yeah. No, actually, so that brings me to the next question I have, which really is the topic of education affordability, right? I think it's top of mind that we're seeing in the news. And as you point out, Penny, um, there's a big debate about what the ROI of the traditional higher education is today. So as you think about that and what cost effective platform style, you have a free platform, which is, you know, one extreme. Uh, you have Coursera that is cheaper, but it's still expensive for certain folks. There's government funding. But how do we think about the concept of alternative credentialing, affordability of education and doing it at scale? Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that topic and, and how we sort of tackle this, this issue? I, I take a first stab at this. You know, this I think there's two things. It's like, what, what do people really need to know? And then what is kind of the dosage you actually need? You know, once again, looking at the tr traditional four-year college system, people thought of the four years before they thought of what has to fill those four years. Whether you're majoring in computer science or art history, four years seems to be a magic number. Obviously, that makes no sense. Uh, and what we also know is that rather than just having exposure to four years of content, which is sometimes, you know, just kind of filled up to make fill up the four years, it, what matters more is, I would say, real mastery of a core set of concepts. Many, many times, even for fairly elite careers, you could probably learn in six months to a year. Uh, and you're seeing that, you know, even computer science graduates from elite universities are now going to these, uh, you know, coding boot camps for six months, and they're getting better jobs because the employers know that these that, that they now have the skills they need, or they're able to take a, a, a Coursera course, or they're able to get some digital certificate. And so uh, I, I think there's a lot of cost savings that can happen just by doing that by getting to kind of the bare essentials of what people really need. Uh, and obviously have options to do more if they want. I think a little bit of it is what we've been talking about. It's socialization, but I think the the employer community is ready for it. I think this Google certificate program that Jeff is referring to is a big, big deal. It's kind of the the first real real thing out there that it has real economic consequences and is sending a signal through the, the country and, and the world. I think you're going to see more of that. And obviously that's a program that once again does not require four years, uh, but if you do it, you're probably on a better track than on a lot of four-year degree programs. And I know Google is thinking about other things like design and UX and, you know, um, uh, 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 designers and things like that that are also, you know, quite good careers. And then hopefully other industries think about it. And then whatever that dosage is, I think there's there could be some very cost-effective ways of, of delivering it. Uh, you have platforms like Coursera, uh, you, you know, you can have support, this pro pro project, schoolhouse.world, where you're able to give real support and tutoring. You're even able to do assessment and credentialing. And, you know, I think we can get the price for a lot of these core things down to the tens of dollars, uh, not the tens of thousands of dollars that, that they currently are. And so if I could pick up uh, one theme I think is really important that happens in many industries as they evolve is you go from vertically integrated supply chains where one provider provides everything and everybody gets the same product at the same cost to ones where people specialize in these horizontal layers and some customers buy one component but not the other 
cost of components. A really important thing about whether it's the Google IT cert, like you said, Saul, Google's coming out with UX design, software project management. IBM's got cybersecurity analyst. Facebook just put out a, a social media marketer professional certificate. So lots of companies are now creating these professional certificates for entry level, no college degree required digital jobs. What we, what we found is kind of pretty exciting is that the marginal cost of delivery on a technical technology platform is quite low. Um, however, you know, face-to-face -face instruction is going to be a bit more expensive, especially if it happens in a place you have to pay rent and have a building and heat it up and things like that. We think what's really exciting is you decouple these things and say, everybody can have a backbone of learning at very low marginal cost. But for certain populations who maybe need more support or prefer certain learning modalities, and Penny, you're right, the money's got to be there, put the extra resources on top of that digital platform to provide that extra kind of support and mentoring that might be required. So California uh, Community College System has adopted the Google IT certificate as the model curriculum for IT. So students in community colleges are actually studying on Coursera to learn IT. Sometimes they go to class, sometimes they don't. You don't have to go to class to get the IT certificate. But if you want those, yeah, that extra coaching and help, you pay a little bit more for it. And I think this unbundling of the high cost portions of education and the low cost portions of education will allow us to do the best job serving the broadest population of people. So in addition to unbundling, I also think we, you know, what, we, what do we know? We know the Pell Grant has worked. Right. It has helped many, many, many people come out of poverty into good careers. We need to now adapt the Pell Grant for the 21st century and for the kind of platforms that we're talking about. It needs to be much more flexible. The requirements are too rigid. It needs to allow for us to not only skill initially, but to skill reskill as well. And um, so that's one point. The second point I would make is we cannot forget the underemployed. That's where also funding flexibility matters. So online is a great opportunity for the underemployed or the person who's, you know, has to work too many uh, low paying jobs in order to put food on the table and a roof over the head, but who has, can have time and, you know, need, you know, in their spare time, wants to be able to learn. Um, and so it's one of the reasons that I reckon, you know, I worked uh, uh, with the Biden administration. I uh, encouraged them to go bigger in their funding of education and their funding of training and skilling, because I think we're at a moment where if we can re we can establish new uh, pathways, if you will, uh, it'll be a much better opportunity for the underemployed worker, for the existing worker who wants to upskill, if you will, for the displaced worker. We also need a better system for the displaced worker. Our current uh, funding mechanisms don't work. And um, I think the unemployment system also, we need to fix the state unemployment system such that they also can make it easier for you to access training while you're in that uh, situation. Uh, and that's a part of the American Rescue Plan. Frankly, the current stimulus bill is to fix those state systems because we got to figure out, we got to marry not just the platform, you've got to also marry the funding, whether I need less help or more help. Uh, we, we need to bring all of those things together. You know, Penny, there's also interesting things happening where um, certain states, the state of New York just announced a major uh, statewide program for unemployed and underemployed New Yorkers, uh, where on the Coursera platform with a lot of these professional certificates, working with SUNY and the College University System of New York and the businesses of New York, again, there's sort of this multi-institutional network uh, we are trying to provide lots of different pathways, like you said. I don't know if New York is doing this, but a number of states are saying, hey, what if studying and earning a credential counts as a work requirement towards certain benefits? I mean, you're, you're developing your human capital. It might not have turned into actually driving to a place of employment, but a lot of people can't afford or have family obligations where they can't drive to a place of employment 
but they can learn. You know, they can learn on a laptop, they can learn on their phone. And I think this human capital is kind of what we need to be more focused on as to whether you drive to a place of employment. I, I think that I think you're right. I think that the thing that then it forces you to become very sensitive to is access to broadband and access to, uh, you know, uh, ubiquitous Wi-Fi, if you will. Um, and we don't have that. You know, when we assessed our cities, we assessed that cities have ubiquitous Wi-Fi in, in particularly underserved communities because of the libraries and the schools. Well, guess what? When they're closed or not available, you realize, you know, homes don't have that. And this is a huge, huge issue. You know, we've been focused as a country on rural broadband, but we need to really make sure that our underserved communities have access because you're only pointing out, and, and then there's also devices, right? The ability to access through devices. There's one other thing I think we need. We need data. And you pointed out that how universities, I think, saw, uh, play a huge role in sort of divining what the systems ought to be or what, what one ought to know. We need better collection of data about what's working. Uh, so that we can be in our dollars wisely and that we have the better understanding of which mechanisms are effective. Yeah, you know, on that one, Penny, we just all these there's so many sort of, I think, promising um, experiments that are happening. We have this big Coursera for business group, which 2000 businesses are using Coursera to upskill their people. We know their jobs. We know what skills they're learning. We know the proficiency in those skill levels. We have a Coursera for Campus product, which is for students. We're now starting to show students the skills that people in the job that they want have. So rather than hoping you get employed when you graduate, while you're earning your college degree, you could be supplementing your curriculum with the kinds of courses and skills that you, that you have some data. It's a signal coming from enterprise into the campus where the student can say, I want this kind of a job here, the skills I'm going to need, I'll supplement my curriculum to get those skills. So I, I do think that the way that data flows through these institutions is a big part of making sure that we have nice transitional bridges from being a student to being employed or being unemployed to becoming reemployed. Now, I have to say, I think all these you know topics are right on. And, and as I reflect on what everyone has said, while we've been talking a lot about the US dynamics, this on, honestly carries across the globe, right? When you think about the issue of data, ubiquity of you know access to broadband, um, how do you learn cheaply? I think those, all of these resonate, you know, across the globe as you think about solutions that you want to provide. Um, I wanted to hit a little bit on vocational training. I know this may not fall squarely and we've been talking a lot about digital, but as you can imagine, not everyone is savvy enough to be, you know, digitally trained or, or get that kind of capability. And on the flip side, there is, you know, a trade skill and a need for trade in certain jobs, right? How do we think about, you know, circumvent this, this, again, back to the circumventing the traditional four-year college concept and driving the, the ability to drive trade capabilities in a way that makes sense for people that have those skills in a, you know, in a scaled manner, uh, because you can actually make real, really good money in some of these trade, you know, routes. So any perspectives on that? Yeah, yeah let I me, mean, well, go ahead. Oh, oh yeah, I mean, to, to your point, Fazila, not, not only can you make gr good money, but for I think a lot of people, it's it's sometimes a more enjoyable job too. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, exactly. many of us have spent hours in a cubicle, you know, sometimes fantasizing, wouldn't it be nice to be able to work with my hands and, and do yep. something outside or, or whatever else? Um, and, and you're absolutely right. You know, uh, I remember I, I presented to a group, the, the National Electricians Association of some, and they blew my mind that they were just looking for kind of high school. They didn't even care about high school grads. They just wanted people who had some basic level of algebra. And then they would pay to they would essentially pay them 30, 40, 50,000 a year while they are in training. Um, and then after five years, they can make six figures plus, you know, well into six figures. And then obviously it's also a type of career where it's very easy to become self-employed, very easy to start creating businesses, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think it goes back to exactly to what Jeff and Penny have been talking about, which is certain aspects of trades as you know traditional path or you know more kind of academic pathways can happen digitally quite efficiently where it's not bound by time or space and and to just point the marginal cost can be pretty darn cheap uh, and then it liberates the in-person experiences to be 
uh, much more on the hands-on. And even there, it could be the community college system. But ideally, we go back to an uh, apprenticeship system where you're actually getting paid uh, close to day one uh, to then learn the skills that, 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 that will empower you. Zila, a couple of thoughts on this. First of all, I absolutely con- agree. There's phenomenal career opportunities in, voca- in, in the vocation, if you have vocational skills. Mm-hmm. And the, the states that have done this best have figured out how to marry their, their high schools and their community colleges so that I can be in the public high school, which I'm not paying for, and I can be taking courses at the community college that are tied to jobs and and they've worked, this is exactly the kind of, they work closely with their local employers to understand the skills that are needed. And um, you see it, whether you're in Wichita or you're in Delaware, or you see phenomenal collaboration going on, Wichita in the aviation uh, uh, area, it's, it's really, um, exciting, you know, in different part, other parts of the country, you know, it's, it's, uh, carpets and different types of, of, uh, uh, that are very automated processes, but you re- need a set of skills in order to do these things. Um, I think then, you know, we've talked about the, I want to keep tying back to not just the entry point, but also the financing. And I think that, you know, flexibility with Pell Grants, we talked about, but I think another idea is to establish a worker training tax credit. If you thought about the fact we get tax credits as companies, if we invest in physical things, right? We get to depreciate them, we get to write them off, et cetera. But we don't get any kind of tax credit. We get an expense but not a credit for training our people. And more and more the work in this country is really going to be totally people-based and very little machinery-based. And so I think we need to be looking at how not only potential lifelong learning and training accounts, but also in um, do we establish for corporations you know, worker uh, tax credits, because I keep wanting to come back to the third point, you got to tie in the employability aspect here. It's got to be that I'm doing this with the, an eye towards I'm going to earn a good income, a livable wage, I can support my family. Right. Um, we actually only have five minutes left, time flies when, when you're having a good conversation. Um, I want to touch on the point of outcomes and KPIs when you think about, you know, the concept of partnerships. Uh, We've talked a lot about data. We've talked about what we want. I guess what for success to be seen, what kind of KPIs do we want to hold ourselves to uh, when you decide to create these partnerships? I'll maybe take a a start at that. I, I think that in a world where all training is costly, you really want to think about the ROI on your investment, right? So you're really thinking about, you're thinking what percentage of person who I paid a lot of money to, you know, got a college degree or or got that job. What's a little bit different is when you have an opportunity to deliver training and and education at very low cost, it's not necessarily so much about making sure that everybody who starts it finishes it. It's really about access because the cost of someone starting it, getting a little bit of skills, not necessarily finishing the entire thing, maybe getting an intermediate credential, getting some skills that will help them, but not completing a course of study. If the marginal cost is low and there are intermediate credentials that are valuable, I really think it's a lot about access. However, I think when you have costly programs, you want to, and, and, and maybe the only benefit is if you end up with some credential, you really want to make sure a high percentage of people who start it get the benefit of the cost. What we're really working with other workforce development partners on is going for a platform with very high scale where the, the KPI is not what percentage of people who finish the Google IT cert get the job. It's something we definitely look at. But what we try to, but if you focus too much on that, you're gonna weed out, and we see this all the time. There are a lot of state, and not just in the US, but in many countries, the metric is the percentages of people who get a job. So here's what they do. They skinny it down so almost nobody gets into the program. They throw tons of money on every single person, whether they needed the help or not, everybody gets a lot of of support. And then they have like 90% placement race for like, you know, 500 people, but we need 500,000 people. So I really think that what you want to do is kind of take a hybrid approach where you want high scale 
worry about giving access to lots of people, make sure they're getting value out of it, but low marginal cost. And then where you have those targeted, more costly interventions and support programs, then really make sure that you're getting the dollars that you're putting into it. But, but don't try to spend the high cost for every single person. You just won't get, I think, to a broad enough population. Sal, you're on mute. <laughs> No, no, I was going to say, I'll just double down on that, whether you call it ROI or whether you're, when we're talking about government spending or philanthropic spending, a social benefit to cost ratio or social ROI. I think that's the key thing. It's amazing how much of, you know, in, in the investing world, that's everyone, that's all you think about. But in the education world, it's amazing how little that is talked about. Uh, even when it comes to, you know, K-12 interventions, higher education, job skilling, no one talks about how much you're putting in and then what is the true total benefit either to the recipient or to society as a whole. And when you start looking at some of these platforms, like what, what Jeff's doing at Coursera, what we're doing at Khan Academy Schoolhouse, the numbers are dramatically different than anything we've ever seen in history before. You know, uh, Robinhood's created a framework of social benefit to cost ratio. And in their framework, and they, me they measure benefit for added earnings, for lifetime earnings for students uh, based on their performance. And they're looking at K through 12 academic metrics, but obviously it applies to even life skill type things. A good not-for-profit intervention gets a social benefit to return inter uh, 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 ratio of about uh, uh, to cost ratio of about five to one, ten to one. You know, when when you any measure of Khan Academy and its efficacy, it looks like it's about five hundred to one. That was pre-COVID. Now our you know we have a high fixed cost, and now our variable costs you know are much lower. With COVID, demand was three x. So you know the social return. Uh, or the social benefit to cost ratio goes to about a thousand X. Uh, I suspect Coursera sees similar numbers. You know, we're hoping to see similar things on schoolhouse.world with the free tutoring. Uh, and so I think the more that everyone just stays focused on that KPI, that metric, and makes everyone compete on that, I think we're going to get to a good place. Great. I was going to say, we, we, are, we have a minute left, and I'm just going to open this up. Uh, we can go maybe a minute longer is... We've talked a lot about radical prop value propositions and things that you know we may want to think out of the box in terms of how we could partner. Is there something we haven't talked about today that you want to throw out as a radical idea to, to consider in the concept of partnerships? I'm open this to so, anyone so this who wants is, to share. You know, this is a little bit uh, not necessarily on partnerships, I'm sure, although I'm sure they could support it. But I, I think there's an opportunity that I hope that the audience doesn't miss. We've already embraced it at Coursera. Now we're also you know a digital company. We have a possibility in a post-pandemic world that never existed before. We have had the ability to do online learning where anyone anywhere can learn what they want. So long, Penny, you're totally right. Broadband is critical for learning. But now you have the chance for jobs to be available almost anywhere. Digital jobs, at least. Digital jobs. The world where if you have a connection and you, and you have knowledge and, and some credentials, you could learn anything you want from anywhere and you have job opportunities, even if they're not in your community, I think is a complete game changer. It puts even more importance on making sure that the fundamental infrastructure, broadband, K through 12 education, so people have got the foundational skills, communities can reinvent themselves in a world where the jobs don't have to be in the community and the campus doesn't have to be in the community. I think that's just an unprecedented opportunity. Penny or Saul, any final comments or? I, you know, look, the radical thought that I think we've been talking about here is we need a systems change and we need a significant at scale systems change. This, it, the system of, of training and education we have today was developed, you know, not with the kind of tools that we're talking about. And this requires really um, enormous bravery in order to actually embrace it. And I, I'm hopeful that, you know, that's something that uh, we as a country will do. Great. I'll just add to what both Penny and Jeff mentioned, you know, I think there's a world and it's not new to what we've just been saying. It's exactly what everyone's been saying, where we can make from pre-K through uh, the core of college or even, you know, life skills and work skills, the marginal costs much, much cheaper, close to zero, uh, and then have much better signaling uh, so that it, it becomes uh, as close to a frictionless, possible, uh, frictionless process as possible. Well, on that note, great thoughts, great ideas, and I appreciate everyone's sharing, and thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nazila. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.